The Kennedys are the most famous family in U.S. political history, so maybe it's no surprise they've got a few supposed skeletons in their closets. Rumors about the bootlegging past of Joseph P. Kennedy, the patriarch of the Kennedy clan, have been around since at least the 1960s, but the truth is more than a little murky. One thing we know for certain is that Joe Kennedy profited from the sale of alcohol just after the end of Prohibition. Whether or not he was involved in bootlegging before that, however, is unknown. Using his ties to the UK, Kennedy imported whiskey and gin from Great Britain and made a tidy sum on the back of America's renewed thirst for liquor. Rumors about his supposed bootlegging prior to this emerged partly thanks to Kennedy's Harvard reunion in 1922, during which witnesses claim he helped to supply the alcohol. This may have been a singular incident, but there are also many other rumors suggesting that Kennedy used his mob connections to get into the game when booze was banned. Crime boss Frank Costello, for example, is one of several men who claimed Kennedy got rich selling liquor during Prohibition. Kennedy's mysterious rise to great wealth has only made the story that much more compelling. Joseph Kennedy made a number of anti-Semitic remarks throughout his prestigious career as U.S. ambassador. He also embarrassed the country by expressing sympathy for fascists in Europe. Rightly or wrongly, many people today remember Kennedy as both a Nazi sympathizer and an all-around awful person. Stories about Kennedy's Nazi sympathies arose partly due to his enthusiasm for appeasement. He believed that Great Britain could never beat Hitler and advised Franklin D. Roosevelt to stay out of the matter. Roosevelt subsequently began talking to Winston Churchill without the involvement of Kennedy. After Japan attacked the U.S., Kennedy became officially toxic and Roosevelt passed him over completely when it came to awarding war offices. Kennedy was not merely short-sighted, however. He had also expressed his genuine admiration for Hitler, often at times that now seem wildly inappropriate. For example, he publicly praised Hitler's supposed military prowess to a graduating class at the University of Notre Dame. On another occasion, he tried to halt the production of a Hollywood film on the grounds that it might offend Hitler and Benito Mussolini. But worst of all were his anti-Semitic remarks. Declassified documents from the German Foreign Ministry show that Kennedy expressed his sympathy for Germany's Jewish problem and complained that Americans had been unduly influenced by Jewish opinions. All right, Mr. DeMille, I'm ready for my close-up. One accusation against Joseph P. Kennedy comes from none other than the iconic Hollywood star Gloria Swanson. During Kennedy's brief foray into the film industry, he developed a romantic relationship with Swanson. Eventually, their affair ended, and their parting wasn't exactly amicable. Kennedy had come to Hollywood to invest his fortune, hoping to make large profits out of the rapidly growing industry. While there, he met Swanson, who was already in some financial trouble due to her lavish lifestyle, so she was only too happy to let Kennedy help her out. Together, the pair developed a business relationship and attempted to make a movie together, an endeavor that proved to be a total failure. A consummate hustler, Kennedy bought Swanson a series of fabulous presents while they were together, including a house. However, it transpired that Kennedy's gifts weren't gifts at all. He had billed all these presents to Gloria Productions, leaving a shell-shocked Swanson with millions in debt. Swanson alleged in her autobiography that Kennedy made a cool $5 million during his time working with her in Hollywood, while she was left bankrupt and brokenhearted. Despite the best efforts of her lawyers and accountants, she never got her money back. Perhaps to satisfy those who never understood how Jacqueline Kennedy could stand to stay with her adulterous husband, a rumor was once printed that claimed she had actually been paid to stay in the family. The story appeared after it was noted that the young couple spent a great deal of time apart. Supposedly, both her husband's cheating and her own political aspirations had caused a great deal of resentment between the two. The rumor ran that Joseph Kennedy, thinking of his son's future political career, offered Jackie $1 million to stay, and she accepted. While there is no way of knowing if the story is true, Jackie responded with characteristic grace. When the original claims were printed in Time magazine, Jackie reportedly quipped to Joseph, why not 10 million? Either way, the couple stayed together and JFK made his bid for the presidency in 1960 with his wife by his side and a few other women as well. President John F. Kennedy is rumored to have had many extramarital affairs during his time in the Oval Office, but his supposed tryst with intern Mimi Alford remains by far the most controversial of the lot. Although Alford herself has claimed her sexual encounters with the president were consensual, the nature of the relationship and the uncomfortable power dynamic between the two continues to raise eyebrows. On her fourth day working at the White House, the 19-year-old intern was plied with alcohol and wound up having sex with the president in an empty room. It was the start of an affair that would go on for many months. I was just 
in a way swept away with it. Aside from the age gap between the then 45-year-old president and his teen employee, some of the stories Alfred told about the affair range from shocking to downright creepy. At one point in her memoir, Once Upon a Secret, Alfred recounted that she performed a sex act on presidential aide Dave Powers in front of JFK. Elsewhere, Alfred mentions taking drugs with the president and also describes his request that she take care of Ted Kennedy, a request she refused to carry out. Aspects of Alfred's allegations have been confirmed by relevant witnesses witnesses, who also worked at the White House. Alfred received her share of condemnation when the story went public, as she had been engaged when she had the affair, but she has also received sympathy for her vulnerable position and young age at the time. Probably the wildest accusation about the Kennedy family is the rumor that they assassinated Marilyn Monroe. The actress was found dead on her bed next to a bottle of sleeping pills in 1962, and although her death was officially ruled a suicide, countless rumors made the rounds in the years that followed. Monroe was said to have had an affair with John F. Kennedy. However, if the rumor mill is to be believed, it was Robert whom she truly loved. Many of Monroe's friends claim she was heavily preoccupied with the married attorney general in the days leading up to her death. I think you're the saddest girl I ever met. You're the first man ever said that. I'm usually told how happy I am. On the day she died, Monroe phoned friend and hairdresser Sidney Gilleroff to complain that Robert Kennedy had shown up at her house to yell at her. He also called off their secret relationship. Monroe apparently responded by threatening to expose the tryst to the public, and before hanging up, she told Gilleroff she was privy to secrets from the highest rungs of government. The close relationship between the Kennedy brothers and Monroe, as well as the fact that the FBI kept a file on the star, inevitably led to rumors of murder. In 1964, author Frank A. Capel wrote a bizarre pamphlet entitled The Strange Death of Marilyn Monroe, in which he alleged that Monroe was assassinated as part of an elaborate conspiracy. Other early rumors stemmed from Norman Mailer, who did not believe his own story but thought it would make him money. He was right in a way, though. True or not, this tale is still popular today. Did John F. Kennedy's considerable charisma win him the presidency, or was it his secret mob connections? There are various iterations of this theory, but the basic gist is this. The Kennedys had some form of cozy relationship with Chicago mob boss Sam Giancana, so Joseph Kennedy approached the gangster to ask for help getting his son elected. The Giancana clan agreed, promising to intimidate voters in exchange for tacit support from a Kennedy administration. In some versions of this story, Robert and John F. Kennedy were then assassinated by the mob in retaliation for not holding up their end of the bargain. As Attorney General, Robert Kennedy was actually pretty tough on organized crime. The source material upon which these rumors are based is certainly interesting. One version of this story appears in a book written by members of the Giancana family, while another comes from a former FBI agent. However, there has been no corroborating evidence of voter intimidation from the time. Still, the rumors persist, and the involvement of mob figures in JFK's assassination only added more fuel to the conspiracy fire. Both Lee Harvey Oswald and the man who shot him, Jack Ruby, seem to have had tenuous mob connections of some kind, connections that have been linked to a wider conspiracy involving a mob-orchestrated revenge hit. In July 1969, political hopeful Ted Kennedy drove his car off a bridge, crashing into a pond on Chappaquiddick Island. His passenger, a young woman named Mary Jo Kopechny, drowned that night. The incident hindered Kennedy's fledgling political career. He was also handed a two-month prison sentence for leaving the scene of the accident, although he never spent any actual time incarcerated. Kennedy had acted quite strangely following the crash. He awaited until 10 a.m. the next day to tell the police, and only spoke to them after his car had already been found. When Kennedy retold the story later on, he claimed he had driven back to the crash site that night with one of his political aides and his cousin in an attempt to rescue the young woman. However, Kennedy's nonchalant behavior upon returning to his hotel, along with the fact that he was seen apparently bone dry in the lobby at 2.25 a.m., posed further questions about his story. My conduct and conversations during the next several hours, to the extent that I can remember them, make no sense to me at all. Some suspected Kennedy of drunk driving, but it was far too late to administer a sobriety test by the time this suggestion was raised. Others suspected an illicit affair of some kind. Kopechny had worked on Robert Kennedy's political campaign and had been at a party with the family that night, although it was not clear why she would have been out so late with Ted Kennedy. He claimed Kopechny had been taken ill, but had curiously left her purse and keys behind at the event. To this day, many people remain skeptical about Kennedy's version of events. 
1991, a lesser-known Kennedy, William Kennedy Smith, the nephew of JFK, was accused of raping a woman at the Kennedy family compound in Palm Beach, Florida. Smith had been out on the town on the night of March 30th, accompanied by two other Kennedys, when he arrived home with a 29-year-old woman in tow. Within the next 24 hours, the alleged victim was admitted to the hospital with a suspected rib fracture, as well as some minor abrasions and bruises. The woman, who later publicly identified herself as Patricia Bowman, claimed that she had sustained the injuries when Smith tackled her at the family home. He subsequently held her down and raped her. During the ensuing investigation, Bowman also claimed that private investigators hired by Smith had been sent to intimidate her. When the story hit the press, it caused a sensation, especially after three more women came forward to make rape accusations against Smith. Despite the uproar, the case ultimately went nowhere. Smith argued that the sex had been consensual and was acquitted of all charges. It was not the last time he was accused of sexual assault, however. Smith's assistant made a similar claim against him in 2004, alleging that she was raped in his Chicago apartment in 1999. The case was thrown out by the judge and never went to trial. If you or anyone you know has been a victim of sexual assault, help is available. Visit the Rape, Abuse, and Incest National Network website or contact Rain's National Helpline at 1-800-656-HOPE-4673.